Hello everybody, my name's Peter Bonnell and Senior Curator at Quad. Uh, and today, another uh, Quad exhibition exploration, a virtual tour of uh, our gallery spaces from our uh, exhibitions in our archive uh, via a 3D tour produced by V21 Art Space. And we thank them very much for doing it. And today I am absolutely thrilled that I have from London, the artist himself, Mark Neville. Hi, Mark. Hello, Peter. How are you doing? Um, I'm recovering from the virus, but generally speaking, I'm on top form. I'm, I'm, I mean, when I heard about that, I, I was I was so worried, but I'm glad that you're getting better. And that's also a good point to say to listeners that hopefully they'll listen to this uh, in the future as well. But we're recording this during the pandemic um, to give our audiences access to our archive. So today we're gonna we're gonna talk about your exhibition in Quad Gallery that was during format off year. Uh, I also work for the Format International Photography Festival and this was our main exhibition for the off year that also included the off-site exhibitions, the portfolio review um, and it's Battle Against Stigma on this 30th of March, the 24th of June 2018 um, and uh, this exhibition delved into when you spent time in the end of 2010, I guess 2011 uh, in Afghanistan as the official British war artist uh, and also your work in eastern Ukraine, working alongside ZOIS, the Centre for Eastern European Studies, who loaned us the works in the exhibition. I should also mention that when people look at the scan and they click on these uh, yellow circles here, they can actually watch the films in the exhibition in, in their entirety. So, Mark, I, I, I did a gallery tour a, uh, a week, couple of weeks ago, uh, and I, as I say, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. So what I want to do is let you, uh, obviously, uh, guide us around the exhibition and tell us uh, about the work and, and, and how it came about. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. So here we are. Should we, should we go and look at the, um, at the Hellman works first? In sure. This part of the gallery? And I should also mention that over this side of the gallery here where I'm using the cursor is a film, Boland Market. Uh, we'll look at that in a moment. And then there's also a screening room behind here as well that has a series of films including paratroopers uh, and at the end of the gallery are the uh, printouts of the emails that you received after you uh, called for members of the military or, or ex-service personnel to tell you about the issues concerns and experiences of serving uh, would it be okay to, to start as well now mark and just say that sure when sure well i mean i think the, the show came about because initially um, we'd had a, a dialogue, uh, Quad and I, about maybe doing a kind of retrospective. And um, uh, when it became nearer the time to thinking about exhibiting, we actually realised, we talked, didn't we? And I think we, we came up with this idea of bringing together just two bodies of work, which were both about conflict mm. and about trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, adjustment disorder, shell shock, you know, whatever the current fashionable term for it is, we all know what it is um, to a certain extent. And um, so I, I think we decided to bring together these, just these two bodies of work, one which was uh, Battle Against Stigma, which was the work that I'd made um, as an official war artist in 2010-11 um, in Helmand, Afghanistan. So I was there for about three months um, and uh, I actually came back myself with uh, suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder mm. and decided to make a whole project about it. So that body of work was coupled with displaced Ukrainians, which was commissioned slightly later. So that was commissioned about 2016, 15. Um, and that focused on the conflict in eastern U Ukraine with Russia, uh, which has been ongoing since 2014 now, and still to this day in 2020, there are casualties every day um, as a result of that conflict. Um, and um, I was really focusing both those projects on young people to a certain extent, because what you tend to realise when you go to a war zone um, is that it's really the vulnerable who suffer the most, so elderly people and very young people. And uh, all the statistics bear that out. So uh, I think something like two million people, at least, have been forced to flee their homes uh, on the uh, on the front of, of Ukraine 
eastern Ukraine front line um, over the past four or five years. And uh, of those two million, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but it's massive. It's something like 30% are, are young people or children. And um, I mean, one of the things that was also very, struck me very strongly about the Helmand work, so if we just pop back there to some of these pictures that I took in Helmand, was how young people are. I mean, it really shocked me. I'd never been to a war zone before, Helmand, Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, I was out on patrol many, many times with the troops over the three-month period. And it was physically punishing and very frightening. And quite often, you know, you'd see these kids just, you know, in the middle of fields, nothing around, nothing to be seen, no buildings, nothing. And they'd be totally alone and they'd kind of appear like phantoms out of the bush. And you'd think, who is looking after these kids? Where have they come from? You know, what is their future? Um, and I very also, bizarre. I, I mean, I should also say that you kicked off a year of well-being of Quad and how we are looking at engaging with our communities, um, engaging with groups in, in the city and across the UK. And we were at one point talking about trying to do a sort of symposium for ex-service personnel to bring them, to bring them together to talk about the, their experiences in Afghanistan and other war zones too. But one thing that really struck me was just, yeah, as you say, the, the well-being of these children. I mean, I, I, I highlighted in, in my talk as well this image of the young boy with the sweets that came from, the I think, the British Army rations, the, the jacket from the ISAF. Um, and there he is, that the poverty is striking, isn't it? And I think you, in your notes as well, if I have this correct, you noted that 60% of, of, of people in Afghanistan, I think are under the age of 25, an immensely young country. Um, and then you almost feel that, are these men, are these, are these relatives of this young boy, are they, are they caring for him? Are they watching over him? Um, how, you know, the, I mean, this is, I think it's me saying that these, these images, every photographer has a way of, of you know, uh, getting over a narrative and a story, but your images, they're so layered and, and tell so much and, and answer so many questions and, um, and but offer up so many questions as well. Um, but it was it was such a, a the harrowing stories that you came back with, and as you say, you you came back and, and, and after a short while, or, or was it a number of years, you were diagnosed with with PTSD, and that's something I think you're still um, still dealing with a little bit now, or, or you're, you're I mean, can you ever get better from something like that? Um, yeah, you can absolutely. In the majority of cases, I think some people have been through so much and witnessed so much that it's. Yeah pretty much irreversible uh, but in terms of damage, if you like. But, you know, it's a process of recovery uh, and it's definitely a process. It's not a switch that goes on and off. Um, There's um, always kind of questions to ask artists that may be difficult for you to answer, but do you feel that you, you have to put yourself in, in that harm's way? Because your work is all about you you don't just go to the periphery of a community you get into that community you have long standing links with that community you become as much as you can a part of that community do you think do, did you ever feel it, it sometimes it's too much or or do you feel that you need to do that to to create uh, great it, work it varies the uh, you know the degree of immersion depends on the project so it varies a little bit um I mean, in, with Helmand, as a, as a war artist, embedded, if you like, with the paratroopers, 16 Air Assault Brigade, it really was it full immersion, you know, and there was no way to quickly hop on a bus or go home and mm. escape it, you know. So I guess in terms of immersion, that's, that's probably the, the most pressured. And uh, it's kind of a cumulative stress. So uh, although I saw some pretty horrible things, it was also coupled with this extreme psychological pressure of hearing bombs go off day and night, mm. uh, being shot at. And, you know, it's like they say, if you, you know, one person explained it to me like this. If you put a cat in a field and let bombs off around it all day, the cat might still survive, but it won't be the same animal anymore. And it's the same with people. And it's absolutely impossible 
to imagine the scenario where anybody can go to a war zone for any extended length of time and then seamlessly readjust to civilian life. It's just not possible. So, you know, what happens with trauma is it gets stored in a certain part of the brain and it's always there unless, you know, it's, it's kind of opened up and moved to a different part of the brain where it can be processed properly. And um, it affects everything, you know, and people self-medicate, take drugs, drink too much. They end up becoming violent, losing their homes, their families, their jobs, and quite often they end up homeless or in prison or in pretty dire straits. So, you know, and I've recently lost a, f a very, very good friend of mine uh, because of this very thing who I was in Helmand with um, when, you know, for those three months, and he really helped me out enormously, and he's he's gone now. Um, oh, that's uh, I mean, six months ago. So it's something that you know, it's it's pernicious, and it stays with you. And so I really made battle against stigma in order to try and encourage veterans who were suffering with PTSD to come forward and seek professional help, because of course in the army you're told to man up. You know, and you've been told that since you were 16 years old in some cases. So it's very difficult to, to break that sense in which you feel like you, you, know, you have to deal with it yourself. Mm. Just talk a little bit more as you, you, you were talking there about your experiences and interactions with, with, with your colleagues and service personnel. We can't sure. quite see it um, here, but we'll, sit, we'll show some links alongside this, this, this tour when we, when we yeah. post it. Well, the book well in, I mean, in a nutshell, I made a book about my own journey with PTSD, but also I included in the book accounts from veterans and other servicemen who used to think that PTSD was nonsense, that it didn't exist. But now that they'd suffered from it or their colleagues had, you know, they really saw it as something very real and, of course, widespread. And... Um, so my idea was to make this book with these accounts, but also my photographs from Helmand. And uh, it was printed out in an edition of 1500. And in 2015, I spent all summer distributing it to mental health charities, homeless centres, uh, prisons, prison libraries, all the places that I thought, you know, maybe if I was a veteran and this had happened to me, I'd become homeless or I'd ended up in prison. You know, I had to reach these people, people who'd fallen through the cracks of society somehow and who had never been treated for PTSD. And um, so my, my target audience with this book was those people. So Battle Against Stigma book was never commercially available. And I just sent it out myself um, to these various homeless centres. I went on a tour of prisons in 2015 doing talks about the project and really tried to reach these people to encourage them to to come forward and get help. And in a way, the most remarkable reaction was I also put online in the independent newspaper online, I think in May 2015, my own account, my own struggle with PTSD after Helmand. And I put at the end of my account, if you're a veteran or the mother or brother or son of a veteran who's suffering from PTSD and you want a copy of the book, please email me and I will send you a copy of the book for free. And as soon as I, 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 that went online on the Independent Sunday, I got an email every 10 minutes for about three months from a veteran uh, or the great relation of a veteran, not just saying, give me a bookmark, send it, but going into extraordinary personal detail about what happened to them when they came back, about the lack of support, um, about this complete inability to readjust to civilian life um, and also going into detail about you know what they saw and what they experienced serving in Helmand or Iraq or Kosovo or Northern Ireland um, a just overwhelming response and then I realized that you know I've done these kind of activist book projects quite a few times during my career but this one more than any other has really struck a chord with people because they saw in me a version of themselves. And because I put it out there in the public domain through a national newspaper, people felt, I think, emboldened to come forward and say, yep, Mark, that's exactly what happened to me. 
but of course much worse because much you know many of these soldiers would have seen and done and been through things that you or I can never possibly comprehend um so uh, it was very emotional for me to see all, as well to see all these responses all these emails I've received or a good selection of them mm. up in quad um first time they'd been exhibited in the UK so here we have is is what I think selected or you selected about 30 30 of the emails maybe out of a thousand or so or more yeah and yeah. I, I recall that 2015 you put the call out but I I recall even on the eve of the exhibition in early 2010, you were still receiving correspondence. Are you still getting any emails from? Are they still coming in from, from people? I am. I am. I mean, um, what was great also was that the, this brilliant exhibition that Quad put on um, meant that it galvanised me into recontacting all those people who I who had written to me. Uh, whose letters I wanted to feature in our exhibition. It galvanised me into contacting those people, of course, to say, do I have your permission to reproduce the letter in the context of this exhibition at Quad? And everyone I contacted, without exception, said, yes, this is important. We were very happy for you to reproduce these letters. But then they would often follow up with more information about how that journey with PTSD had gone and what what had happened to them since you know and in some cases people had you know made more development in their adjustment to civilian life and in other cases very sadly people were still clearly absolutely devastated um, I just wanted to pop into the into the screen room because it's so poignant to hear those stories and and how it affected you but how it affected the 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 serving personnel. In fact, maybe so I don't mess up the video, but people can go on to this this video and there's there's four of them, one after the other. There's even a an interview you did with a um, an officer who talks sort of matter of factly about how the government or how the UK is approaching working in Afghanistan. But perhaps it's actually just here. If you go through you'll see one of the um the film's paratroopers and there's these these squaddies for want of a better term are uh, sunning themselves, you know, trousers around the ankles on the deck chairs, having a, a crafty smoke, or they're, they're doing, you know, practicing boxing or having a shower in the in the open air. And what I thought was so incredibly poignant, particularly as you talk about the the issues that people, you know, suffer from as they come out of serving in these war zones, is the is the boredom between the engagements, the the everyday, the the normalcy. Could you talk uh, just briefly about that? I mean, what, what did you see? What, how did it affect you? Was it? Do you think that made it worse? The times when it was waiting to go out. Um, I, you know, it's it's been strange to go through this current quarantine in the UK because of coronavirus, but also not strange for me because actually there are so many analogies between, um, you know, the kind of condition of living. In a, in a space which is terrorised in some sense, as Britain is by this virus, and war zones. So you, as we do now, living through this, you know, it's a kind of roller coaster of emotions in which, you know, you're kind of struggling with a sense, real sense of frustration that you're not able to do certain things, you're not able to lead a normal civilian life, um, uh, you miss certain things, you know, the pub, uh, socialising in certain ways um, and so you do have these stretches of, of boredom punctuated by fear, anxiety uh, enormous levels of stress um, I mean going out on patrol was very very frightening and physically punishing you know so you're walking in a line with with maybe 10 or 15 soldiers and you're walking in a straight line because the guy at the front has a metal detector and he's using it to check that there aren't any IEDs, which means improvised explosive devices or landmines, effectively, uh, planted in, in their path. Um, so you're constantly very aware that if you step left or you step right or away from this line of direction, you might step on a landmine and, you know, you not only endanger your own life, but you endanger the life of the soldier ahead of you and the soldier behind you. 
So, uh, you know, the level of stress during those trips for me was was um, through the roof, as you can imagine. I mean, I should also say that when you did a, a great tours of the exhibition for us, and you came back and did various things, um, and I did tours as well. I even did a tour of the show for uh, the Derby Ukrainian Society. We were very moved by the displaced Ukrainians' work. We felt it very a personal connection as well. Some ex-serving personnel, someone who was in the RAF, came and, and, and was told about the exhibition through his wife and came and spoke to me. Because I know you were looking for more and more yes. stories as well. And the, the stories that came back, this, it, it just struck such a chord, this exhibition, and was so moving and, and important to do. But I want to just, just gently move into, because our time's coming up shortly, but to show this, this an excerpt from this film, Bowl and Market, because not only, it, 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 I think in my personal opinion, did you uncover your own experiences, of course, and what that meant and the experiences of the ex-service personnel, but you also really shone a, I, I, we've talked about it already really, but shone a spotlight on the plight of the Afghani people. But one thing I loved about Bowl and Market as we play it here, and this was this big projection that greeted views that came into the exhibition space, you're on it, I think it was an armoured personnel carrier moving through this part of Helmand where the Taliban had moved, been moved out. And you, you're, you're sort of the unflinching gaze of your camera looks on at the, the, the people getting back to a normal life. And then you see the worry eyes of the elder generation, but there's more sort of open, shining eyes of the, the younger generation. But you really got to, the, I think, to the nub of this poor country that has gone through so much. And it's trying to make um, a new a new go of things, for one of a better term. Yeah, so I was picked up by a kind of tank with a huge machine gun on the front of it, um, coming out of a kind of turret. It's a kind of husky tank, armoured vehicle. And um, we drove for about six hours to get to this market, Bowdoin Market. And it was shown to me as a kind of example of a success story for British and ISAF forces in that it used to be Taliban run. And now it's not, or wasn't at the time. Um, you start to see the beginnings of commerce and trade again. So you see things being bought and sold. You see mobile phones. You see cars. Um, however, you know, I, I think what the film captures is uh, how alien we are, as as you know, as as the Western um, occupiers, if you like, of Afghanistan at the time. You know. So people are responding not only to me as my as a as a guy with this huge camera that's pointed in their faces, but they're responding to the vehicle I'm in, which is this tank. So, you know, it's quite something to see a tank go through your local market. It's like a spaceship landing in 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 the centre of Derby. You know, it's gonna it's gonna attract some attention and be quite frightening for people. And I think what what you see is people's reactive, very ambiguous reactions. You're not sure if it's fear or respect or, or, or hatred. And this kind of ambiguity in, in the eyes of the locals becomes the subject of the film. And it turns us, the viewer, into the, into the aliens, into the other, which was important for me to do because actually, you know, all the BBC reports I'd seen on the news just prior to going to Helmand, it was exactly the same kind of visual information. So you have soldiers uh, silhouetted against a, sun, a sunset, you know, um, holding guns. And it was all about this kind of Lawrence of Arabia type experience for British forces rather than what it's like for local people there. We could talk for hours and I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this with us today. Uh, I'd like to yeah, really thank you so much. and. Um, uh, I'd also like to, to sign off now and just say huge thanks to um, our funders, uh, Arts Council England and Derby City Council, and also for Format, um, our partners and, and co-funders as well is, is um, the University of Derby. Uh, and thank you again to V21 Art Space for producing this 3D tour. Uh, if you're listening to this during the pandemic, stay safe and well. Uh, if not, I hope you're still well too. Thank you for watching this. And Mark Neville, thank you so much again. Good luck with the Deutsche Bors Photo Prize. We're all rooting for you at Quad. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Peter. It was a great experience and a great experience exhibiting at Quad. Really first rate. Thank you.